The following program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. She's got the news. She talks with newsmakers. She encourages us to laugh. And she cries with us. Speaking truth to power and questioning authority daily, it's the Nicole Sandler Show. All right. Welcome to a Wednesday, and what a weird day it is. Uh, The full moon was a few nights ago, or I'd say we're right in the middle of it now. Um, uh, Just an ugly day, because I've been watching the murder trial. The trial of the former cop who killed a man named George Floyd. And yesterday was disturbing as hell. Today, perhaps even more disturbing. Because um, they finished with the eyewitness testimony. All the people that were there on the street who watched it, whose voices we have come to know from watching that video, that nine and a half minute long video. Unfortunately, now numerous times so now we know whose voices they all are the guy who was you know shouting at george floyd get up man get out just get up get out of get out of there um i thought it was one of the other cops taunting him it was not it was this other man the last man to take the stand who it's funny i i look at him as uh, this older guy um turns out he's 61 so my age so i yeah you know, older guy. And um, he he just couldn't make sense of what he was seeing. And, well, that makes sense to me because nothing about this case makes sense. Um, today, we saw some of the footage just moments ago from the cops, uh, body cameras. The cops, there were three cops behind the car and, and two others in addition to Chauvin who were on top of George Floyd. And one of them, we saw the footage from his body cam. It might have been both of them. I was in and out, you know, all day. And I got to tell you, um, George Floyd is not the most sympathetic character. He was obviously high on something, not not a um, a, a capital offense. Last time I checked, Um he was a bit of a whiner uh, because I, I get when he was in real distress when when Chauvin had his knee on his neck and he couldn't breathe. But even moments before when they were trying to get him into the car, when they were walking him across the street, he was whining and bitching and complaining about everything. And it might have been the drugs he was high on. I don't know. Might have just been the way he was. Um, but there, there wasn't much difference in his tone between when he was screaming at them, I'm claustrophobic, I can't be in the back of this car, to when he was down on the ground killing him. Again, not a capital offense. He didn't deserve to die, and certainly not at the hands of these rogue cops. And by the way, that that creepy defense attorney who was all over Genevieve Hansen, I think her name is, yesterday, um, the, the paramedic, the, the firefighter EMT, and said, did you call them a bitch? Well, did you hear the way the cops address George Floyd? Fucking this, and you fucking shut up, and you fucking do this. So I don't want to hear from that goddamn defense attorney again. This whole thing is so disturbing. So disturbing. All right. Uh, this call came in right as I was going on the air. So let's go right to the phones. Hi. Hi. Who's this? This is Linwood again. How hey, are you doing today, Hey, Linwood. Good. How are, we haven't heard from you in a while. Oh, boy. How are well, you doing? You. How are you doing? Well, well, I'm still learning. Well, the person that actually called the enforcement officials a bitch was the non-white gentleman. Right. Not the white female. Okay. But and, no, she... But, 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 but they the did ask... And he made the threats toward the enforcement official that I will, you touch me again, I'm going to kick your ass. Okay, yeah, that was the guy who testified yesterday. That was the alleged mit- yeah. mixed martial arts guy who was chattering through the whole time. Time. Right. Now, as far as this case is concerned, it's not a murder case. It's going to be a manslaughter. Yeah. Because they cannot prove they cannot prove that Mr. Chauvin intended to do that. Um, but but but, another, but but let me ask you this. But, but, and then what I'm going to let you talk. We're going to have a conversation here. Let me ask you this because sure. the video I just watched from that other vantage yeah. point from the the body cam mm-hmm. um, shows they were checking his pulse on his leg. Yeah. 
when he was unconscious. And I couldn't hear what they were saying, but it sure appeared to me that he had no pulse. And yet Chauvin still kept his knee on George Floyd's knee on neck. The neck. That's, I'm sorry, that's reprehensible, yeah. that's vindictive, that's uncalled for, that's torture, that's murder. But can you get 12 people to prove I that know. he intended to do that? Yeah, I don't know. And it, it was it was Mr. Chauvin, as well as the other enforcement officials in that agency, trained in that maneuver. Uh, but apparently those who trained them in that maneuver said he wasn't do, using it properly. When, you know, after a minute, when George Floyd was obviously subdued, he's on the ground, take your fucking knee off his neck. Now, here, now, now, Nicole, here, here's another thing. Yeah. He wasn't trained properly, but Mr. Chauvin's been at that agency for X amount of time. Yep. So how could he have not been trained correctly if he was trained in that maneuver? Yeah. Good question. And it's a, it's a lot of questions I'll have to ask. But there's another thing that I'm also concerned about. Yeah. Jury intimidation. Uh-huh. Because I was reading in the AP yesterday about cases similar to this where enforcement officials have harmed a non-white person and the juries that were ecleptic as this one found the enforcement official guilty but when they went back to the appeals court they found evidence of jury intimidation based on the protesters sitting outside gawking at the with at the jury members and the fencing and the pretty much the subtle threats of if you don't convict this man we're going to riot. Well, you know what? I hate to say it. They don't need to see the, the protesters outside. If they don't convict that man, I, I don't want to be here when, uh, you know, that night falls. I don't want to be here. And, I was that's, in, what, and I, that's what the biggest issues is. That. Right. Well, the thing is, I don't know how anyone can watch this and not convict him. Derek Chauvin should never walk free again. What he did is sickening. It is murder. It was targeted. It was from the minute they saw him, they treated him as if he was a murderer. Well, I'm sorry. What was he guilty of? Passing a bad 20? Last I checked, that wasn't a capital offense either. That's not a capital offense either. But it's... I mean, even if he is not convicted for this, which I doubt he's going to get off on this anyway, based on that composition of that jury. Yeah. Even if he is found not guilty, Chauvin cannot really go back out there and live an actual life as he once did. Yeah, that's true. Because he's going to be, because wherever he goes, like with George Zimmerman down Mm -hmm. in Florida Mm -hmm. and like Casey Anthony in that same state, no one's going to hire him based on the fact that people can now and this mob mentality can rush him at any moment. Look what they did to those officers that one of them, when they was on bail, when people saw them in a grocery store, they uh-huh. bum rushed them and threatened to use the physical violence against them. It's not going to be the same whether he's guilty or not. Hmm. He's going to have to always watch his back because yep. somebody may take a shot at him. Right. That is true. And, that is true. And I think. I think this whole I think the trial should have never been broadcast Hmm. because already with the political severity of the situation as it is, I've been listening to it on C-SPAN all morning. Right. That's where I've been watching it. Yep. Because the networks have been cutting in and out when, you know, when they finished with the eyewitness testimony, I guess CNN cut away. I've been on C-SPAN. But, um, yeah, I have mixed feelings about that. I mean, I think this obviously there's a hell of a lot of interest in this case, as there should be. Um, I, I But. You know, and the emotions it's bringing up. We saw that uh, McMillan, the older gentleman, break down. It was the first time he had seen the video since this happened. And when they sh- they pulled back and went back to the courtroom, he was had his, his head down on his desk on the desk and sobbing. And he wasn't the only one. Um, this should never have happened. It should never have gotten this far. I've been asking the same question, like, well, how did it go from zero to a hundred from the looks of this thing? He was in the car. Yeah. And he was here. One officer saying, relax, sir, relax, sir, relax, sir. And the thing is, you know what? He was in the car. He was being belligerent. He was screaming. I'm I'm claustrophobic. Let me out. I'll tell you what. They shouldn't have let him out. They should have closed the door, made sure the AC was on and left him in there and let him scream. Because what happened was 
he came out. They, I, no, I'm not defending the cops in any way, shape, or oh, form no, here. Not at all. But his screams were exactly the same as they were inside the car. He was crying wolf while inside the car when he came out, and it was legit. They're probably thinking he's still fucking with us. When now, he was silent, now, now, when they I realized he, perspective. when they realized that he went limp is when they should have said, holy shit, we're hurting him. Um, but they didn't. And they kept the pressure on and killed him. I think the manslaughter is going to stick and not murder because of that right there. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. It, it, it's it's going to go to, it's going to go to manslaughter, not murder. Um, now, the agitators, the Sharptons and the Benjamin Crumps out there, they're going to yeah. be hyping up the crowd, yep. saying, we want blood, we yep. want blood, we yep. want blood. But I'm like, hey, guys, listen, if y- y'all don't want to go out there doing that because they can use that against you. Yeah. And right, this, yeah. And this, this attorney, he, I mean, I've heard comments about him. He's incompetent. He's a fool. But he's not. He's got a lot of aces in the hole that the prosecution does not have. And that is one of the aces he has in the hole. Politics. Mm-hmm. Sharpton and Benjamin. Sharpton and Benjamin Crump. They can use them. It says, "Look at these belligerent niggers out here. They're rallying up the base. They're out there saying, hey, kill, 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 bloody murder, bloody murder, bloody murder.' Oh, the judge should have moved the trial to somewhere else to avoid this. Up, uh, vindicating of sentence, or uh, we need a new trial. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Look." I'm in Florida. You're where are you in Virginia? I'm in Central Virginia. I have, I'm see, I remember with that. What with, I um, remember that Trayvon you're in Martin. Virginia, and so Linwood. The, the, that's the thing. It doesn't matter where they are. Yes, and the, I'm, I'm sure the tensions are really high in Minneapolis, as Jack Rice has told us. The many times he's checked in, they are. But it doesn't matter where you are in this country. Actually, around the world, oh, no. the world is tuned into this. And I, and I'm sorry, George Floyd. Uh, in the in the video we saw today, in the body cam video, we saw another viewpoint that we hadn't seen before, and we saw George Floyd being erratic, being uh, you know resisting arrest, surely kicking, doing things that that would warrant the use of some force, not killing him, not what they did to him, but gives them a little more ammo in their fight to say, look, he was he was a loose cannon. Um, yes, but they, exactly. they're they the ones who escalated it. He, when the, he, at first, yes, he was all loosey-goosey. You saw him in the store. He's like dancing and singing. He was having a jolly old time. And it wasn't until the cops, and, he, and then he got started whining and crying. And it's like, you know, man up. I'm sorry. You're, you did something well, wrong. Nothing, You're being arrested. Here's another thing I want to bring to your attention, too. Yeah. I think the, if he is found not guilty, Mr. Chauvin, that is, yeah. you, have to blame this, you have to blame this primarily on the press because the press did hype this up. And they belligerent it. They played it to the max to the point where the people's opinion and the people's ideological thinking went out of the window. It was all about he's a murderer. He's a killer. Well, we need is. to get this guy. <laughs> I, I hear you. <laughs> you know? I know. Um, but look, I, again, I watched the whole nine and a half minutes again yesterday and then saw it again last night and saw it again today. And it hasn't numbed me to it at all. It's made me more and more nauseous each time I've seen it to the point where how could this man, Chauvin, stand there like that? All calm. You you notice he didn't sound at all ruffled, uh, except when somebody stepped off the sidewalk and he was he had the presence of mind to pull out his thing of mace. You know, there's something cold about that. There's something uh, really scary, evil about that. And I'm sorry, that's not the kind of person we need uh, as a police officer. But as well, Ms. Ms. Sandler, too, is that the sort of mentality that these enforcement officials in these respective agencies are trained not to show emotion, not to have connection to the public, but to look at the public as, as broad as 
the enemy. Yeah, but you know what? You listen to Joe Biden. You listen to Joe Biden. And and again, I'm not the biggest Joe Biden fan. And I'm not a fan of the defund the police slogan, which I thought was the biggest, most asinine campaign out there that, you know, is a problem when you have a leaderless movement. You get stupid slogans like that. They don't need to defund the police. They need to retrain the police. They need to start over. And what Joe Biden said is exactly right. We need to decentralize everything. It needs to be neighborhood based policing. All these witnesses who lived in the neighborhood, they said they didn't know these cops. The only exception was that guy McMillan who said he had met Chauvin five days earlier and had seen him around the neighborhood. If we had neighborhood policing, if we had community cops who knew the people in the neighborhood, who was officer friendly, hello, who could talk to the people and say, hey, man, what are you doing? You passed about 20. Let's talk. Um, Instead, they escalate to the point where somebody gets killed. And that's not okay. There's a lot of other synergies involved in this as well. Like one, the way that particularly as a black man, how enforcement officials are viewed upon us by a different perspective. We look at the enforcement officials as the enemy of the people, the enemy to black progress. And then what is the enforcement officials when it comes to white viewers looked at? Oh, they're nice guys. No, not at all. Yeah. And you see, this is the problem with generalizations. Propaganda cuts both ways. Right. It does. And this is the problem with generalizations, because frankly, here in my community, I have the same problem with the cops as anybody, although I probably don't have to fear for my life every time I'm pulled over. But they're still assholes. They're still they're still roided out jerks. And they need to do drug testing of cops. Forget about the public. I agree Test with that the one. cops for steroid use because that's well, a lot of this is roid rage. A lot of that also the drug abuse in these agencies is very rampant. Oh yeah. You can look at some of these guys the way their 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 physical physiques are. Yep. They're like bodybuilders. Yep. And I- You know, it's a lot of things that have to be really corrected here, but you cannot correct this problem with the elements in the room looking for looking for cheerleading possessions. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to yell from the right. Everybody wants to yell from the left. Nobody wants to talk to each other. Right. No, that's true. Even as a as a black man myself, who's I've had some a small run in with enforcement officials, but nothing like this or nothing too extreme. I'm typically very cordial with the enforcement officials as they are. But when you get that propaganda that this is all they are, what do you expect to believe? Right. Well, and because of people are like that. Life, if you're being told consistently, be afraid. Be yeah. very afraid. But you know what, Linwood? The same propaganda that is perpetuated on white people what? as... When you see black people, be afraid. Well, that's be very bullshit. Afraid. I, I know. And that, that shit has got to end. But I'll tell you one last thing. When I was arrested for daring to try to ask a question at my then Congressman Alan West's so-called Alan town West, hall meeting. I saw that one. Right? I thought that was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. And while I was in custody, they were vindictive on me because I dared to speak out. And I challenged the guard who stuck four of us in a cell and forgot about us. That he owed us an apology. So he sticks me in a a cell by myself in solitary confinement, and they leave me there for hours and hours and hours. Long story short, everyone's heard it already. They maced me because I begged them not to make me go back in the cell after the door opened because it will fuck with your head when you're stuck in a little cell alone and the door is locked and you can't get out. I thought they were going to kill me. (laughs) And this cop maced me, and I thought they can do whatever they want And I have no recourse. And that's what was so terrifying. So I get and and if my skin was darker, I'd probably have every more reason to be freaked out. Freaked out. Absolutely. Yeah. Our our society is broken, is really, really sick. And I don't know. I don't know that we can return from it. I really don't. I don't think we can either. Yeah. I mean, whether he's guilty or not, I don't think it's going to be the same whether he whether it cuts both ways. Because the tension is so hot, and yes, yep. the CNNs, the MSNBCs, the Fox News, Fox News in particular, they play a very massive role <laughs> in the reason why the country is in the condition that it's in today. Oh, yes, they do. 
Uh, yes, they do. And um, they should be held accountable. You know, they couldn't do the shit they did they, that they do if they were an over the air television network, because over the air television is governed by the FCC. There are rules and regulations. Oops. Well, we lost Linwood. Linwood, thank you for calling. The FCC governs that, you know, uh, over the air broadcasting, but not cable. On, on regular television, a channel like Fox couldn't call itself news because they're not news. They're propaganda. On cable, it's the Wild West. It shouldn't be anymore because cable's been around for decades, but it's still the Wild West because the regulations haven't been updated. Maybe it's time for a new a rewrite of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, um, and maybe I wouldn't be suspended from streaming on YouTube right now. All right. I'm I'm riled up. I'm not in a great mood. I'm really disturbed by what I saw. Um, and earlier today, I mean, what I thought I was going to do today is play a lot of the trial. What's going on now is uh, they're showing they're showing video from different vantage points. They're showing uh, here. Let's let's just bring up the audio a little bit on this. It's it's the group of bystanders. Oh, this is Officer Tao's. A body cam showing the, the the onlookers all right we've seen it and them arguing with him so you see the EMT woman you see the, all the people that were shooting video um, so that's what they're showing now is the the vantage point f- from the side the, and, and we don't need to see it again I don't think I could take it again so what I wanted to do was focus on what's happening in states around the country Right. We know I spoke to the uh, uh, the secretary of state of Arizona last week about all these horrific laws that are working their way through the legislature. Well, I'm in Florida and the Florida legislative session is underway. It's a 60 day session once a year. And so happens that I know sort of one of our new freshman um, uh, uh, state representatives. Her name is Robin Bartleman. And um, I caught up with her in Tallahassee this morning. And I think. I think this is what we're going to do. If something big happens in the trial, I'll keep an eye on it and I'll interrupt. But if not, let's let's uh, get into a, another Florida report because, oh, my God, it is duh. Here we go. All right. On the line with me now is Representative Robin Bartleman. She's a Florida State House representative. But we and this comes after many years of being a member of the Broward County School Board. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but the first time we met was shortly after I had moved back to Florida. So it had to have been like 2003, 2004, just as my kid was starting kindergarten. And you were out um, in Pembroke Pines. Um, handing out literature. I think it was your first run for school board. And it was outside of the, the Kiss um, Chili Cookout that they had going on in the in the C.B. Smith Park, I believe. I actually like, remember that. I was, <laughs> I was in the heat yep. in, the, uh, in the parking lot. <laughs> yes. And you were giving out cards and say, I'm running for school board. And something clicked because of all these years, you know, I remembered that moment as when we first met. Then, you, of course, you went on to school, serve on the school board for how many years? 16. 16. Wow. Yeah. And, <laughs> and now you decided uh, in this last election cycle to, to move up to the Florida House. So you now represent Florida's, what district is it? I'm 104, which is Weston, Southwest Ranches, Pines, west of Flamingo, and Ivanhoe and Davie, west of 75, to be very specific about yes, my district. Yes, yes. So you're just south of me. Uh, my sister is in your district, and she happens to be a um, a, a, a teacher in Broward County School. So awesome. um, yeah, I'm, her. I'm up in Coral Springs these days. So anyway, so th- that so how do you like it? How different is it from being on the school board, being in the state legislature? It's very different because you feel so removed from the community. Um, when I make a decision, when I made a decision on the school board, you know, people would come and have, you know, they'd uh, pre COVID, mm-hmm. they'd come and have comments. You would, you know, I was, I was in Publix and people would stop me in Publix because when it's an issue involving their children, it's so important to them. So it's a little different because I'm making my decisions in Tallahassee and I feel so far removed. And because of COVID, a lot of people aren't coming up and we're having news meetings. So I miss that aspect of, you know, being in my community i'm sending out newsletters i'm staying in touch i'm on hundreds of zoom calls but you're kind of up here isolated and you go all day every day and all night 
So it's incredibly different. Yeah. And people don't realize that. I mean, Florida, the geography of Florida is weird. It's a long, uh, long, thin state. But Tallahassee is way up in the northwest corner. And with the most populous region of Florida is down here in the southeast corner. Right. And that, that is like a, it's like an eight hour drive and a ridiculously expensive flight from South Florida to Tallahassee. Right. I've only been able to go home once uh. um, and I'm going to go home for this weekend for the Easter weekend. You just feel you feel like you're not part, you feel so separated from your community. I think that's the biggest issue I have. And it's just so fast paced. And we're in the school board. You're working all year. You're meeting with constituents right. all year. You're making policy all year. This is like you have 60 days to get everything done and that's it. And it's just, it's like a race. Yeah. <laughs> and and usually in, in normal years, there are, you know, lobbying days. I, I know Broward days, for instance, <laughs> I live, we live in Broward County, where where citizens would go up en masse and, and meet with the legislators and, and have input and participate. But none of that is happening because of COVID. No, everything's been handled over Zoom. I did participate in a Zoom meet and greet, but there's nothing like having people come to your office, share their personal stories. When you're on Zoom, it's very, uh, I wouldn't say scripted, but there's not that one-to-one interaction you can have if someone pulls you aside in a breakout room or while you're sitting at a lunch, they turn to you and say, oh, this is an issue. This is what's happening. So you don't have that. So it's a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, and we've had like a lot of controversial legislation up here. Uh, so <laughs> we get into some of that in a minute. Yeah, so it's the emails. It's it's definitely different. I feel really good about the change though because I feel like I one my daughter was graduating, so I feel like I wasn't a parent in the school system anymore. I didn't really as a classroom teacher and as a former assistant principal, I felt like you know, do I have skin in the game when I don't have a child in the classroom? So that was a concern of mine of remaining on the school board, even though a lot of people did not want me to leave because I was definitely a voice for teachers. Yes. Um, but I also felt like I was traveling to Tallahassee and always fighting uh, on behalf of the school district, on behalf of public education. And then I got involved in the Climate Change Task Force and the Department of Juvenile Justice Circuit 17 Advisory Board. So I kind of was spreading my wings into other areas. So it made sense for me to take all of this uh, experience and passion to Tallahassee where I can make a difference here. And so it's definitely, uh, there's a learning curve. Everyone says it's like drinking water from a fire hose. I didn't know what that meant until I got here. <laughs> and But I feel like, I, I, you know, I have some plans. I want to work on kid care. That's a long-range mm-hmm. goal of mine. So I'm just going to keep pushing and uh, get my bills heard and do what I can to help Floridians. Great. And, and there is a local component that I want to say. Um, I have had, since when I was a school board member, I was receiving calls about how to help people navigate the unemployment system. People have issues with agencies. And the one thing I do like is, of course, I gave out my cell phone number to everybody (laughs) and they all have my email. And so we are able to provide effective constituent services. So if anyone's listening and they're having issues, don't navigate the unemployment system alone. If you have questions about COVID, uh, I had issues with driver's license and, you know, how people are getting out. We can actually help you with that. And that was my favorite part of the school board because I could meet with parents, meet with their kids directly see how I'm changing their lives. So I don't want to leave out that aspect of the job because that's what I'm here for. And I've heard uh, stories that'll make you cry, uh, unable to access benefits. So my email is robin.bartleman at myfloridahouse.gov. Don't hesitate to email me with any question. If we don't handle it, like we have um, questions about immigration, we'll bump that up to the federal level. But things that we can handle, we're going to help you and do everything we can to assist you in finding the answers to your questions. Um, my cell phone is 954-668-3662. I don't mind giving that out wow. to people. Just call me. Um, that is, you know, I love that part of my job, like knowing that I'm making a difference for people. And so that's the most rewarding part. And so I I know I'm focusing on policy right now, but when I get back, that's what's important. Well, policy is, you know, the name of the yeah. game right now. And before we get into some specifics, because you brought up, there's some really um, horrible legislation working its way through uh, mm-hmm. Tallahassee right now. We'll get into that. But I do want to mention one last thing. You're great. And we're lucky to have you there in Tallahassee and representing Thank us. You. Florida has a majority of um, more Democrats registered in the state than Republicans. And yet, 
office, the governor's office, the executive branch, the legislature and the Senate is all top heavy with Republicans, even though we have more Democrats. Um, And this, you know, in the legislature, the, the the session lasts for, as you mentioned, 60 days. It's March, I guess, March and April. Um, yes. And so it's sort of a part time job. And the pay for people like you is a part time position. This yes. is a really bad thing because we need full time representation. And most normal people can't, you know, take a leave from their regular their day job, as it were, for 60 days to go up to Tallahassee to represent their community. So uh, we're missing out on some good people who potentially could you know, be your colleagues. Am I right there? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. This really is a full-time job and it is 60 days and you are away from your families. And I look around and I say, how are people affording to do this? What are they like? It does exclude a lot of people. Um, Also um, you do work full-time. Like from, I hit the ground the day. I thought I would have a day to sleep after campaigning for two years. And I was like, wasn't going to get up and just stay in bed all day the day after the election. And Uh I got a text right away from the Speaker of the House. And so it began and I had to do all of this stuff. So it is a really good point that it is a full time job. And the same thing with the school board. There's a bill right now to eliminate the salaries of school board members. Eliminate? They're anemic as it is, right? And so they want to eliminate? I worked, I was a countywide school board member. I worked usually seven days a week. I I went to schools, community events. It, It would be very difficult for somebody to do that job and not have any pay. And it's interesting because I just had a bill pass through committee where we created a, we increase the pay for a board who's going to supervise an airport. So they should get paid, but school board members shouldn't get paid. Right. So it's kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting up here how people view different branches of government. Right. And the salary for state representative, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is. I'm guessing it's somewhere in the $30,000 a year. No, it's range. like 29. Oh, 29. Oh my God. That's criminal. I'm sorry. Well, thank you for doing this because basically you're volunteering and getting a stipend for your troubles. I mean, that's that's what yeah. it seems like. Well, it's a passion. You're definitely doing it to make a difference. So wow. that's, and, and you just keep saying that to yourself when you have a bad day or when you're sacrificing the time away from your family that, okay, I'm doing this because I'm going to make a difference in the lives of people. So that's what keeps you going, especially when you have the bad days. Right. And you realize that the only people up there who, who are doing it are those who can afford to. So maybe, you know, people who money is not an issue for them or those who are making a real sacrifice, as I'm sure you are with your family, um, to yeah. do the job for such measly, uh, you know, compensation. It's just not right. And I wanted to make sure I got that out there. So so okay. Robin Bartleman is with us. It's your first term in the in the uh, legislative session in Tallahassee. And some of the bills that are working their way through uh, this year are just horrific. In fact, the I, one that already passed, which is one we were really worried about, HB1, known as the anti-riot bill, is not an anti-riot bill. To me, it seems like an anti-protest bill. Um, wh- what happened with this? So that was definitely a priority of the governor, hence House Bill 1. Yes. Uh, The vote was on party lines. The Democratic uh, caucus, actually, we we took a united position. It was my first time speaking on the bill. Wow. And uh, a bill on the floor, but I decided that this was, you know, this bill, it's part of history right now. Yeah. We we created this bill. And I am so fearful because it's really going to create unintended consequences for people and they don't realize that. So the when I spoke on the floor, well, first I want to uh, say my colleagues did an amazing job speaking about, you know, the women's right protest, which is the first protest. A hundred women were injured, but now you and I are able to vote because of that. Civil rights protests, Martin Luther King, the March on Washington, um, the Boston Tea Party. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are all really important parts of history. So when I spoke about why I was opposed to this bill, I wanted to give a different angle because as a mother, I encourage my children to stand up for what they believe in and stand up for what's right. And I do not condone looting or hurting businesses or harming people. I don't think anyone condones that. No. But the issue is, is this bill has really big unintended consequences. So you can attend a peaceful protest and stand there with your sign like my daughter has. I was so proud of her when she 
she marched uh, with students after Marjorie Stoneman Douglas to end gun violence. Mm-hmm. And if there's one bad player, you can get caught up in that and you're charged with a felony. And not only are you charged with a felony, you're denied access you know, to bail, which usually you have immediate bail. Oh my God. And you don't have that. So short of having like making sure I buy a body cam for my daughter, because I am proud of my daughters, how amazing they are. And, uh, or when I go to a, a peaceful march, short of having a body cam on me, how are you going to defend yourself when there's somebody else, another, a bad player who then causes everyone to get in trouble? Absolutely. And, so, and so it, would you suggest that anybody who's going to go to a protest in Florida now have a body cam? Well, we can't afford body cameras, but I would definitely be filming yourself <laughs> to say, look, I wasn't part of this yeah. <laughs> because, because it's so subjective. And the, 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 the law is subjective in the language. And, and so it's just, it's, it's a scary bill because it really, it, it hurts lawful citizens and it inhibits our ability to have freedom of speech because now when you go to a protest, you're, you're not going to feel comfortable because God, God forbid the opposing side starts acting out. What happens to you? Are you part of that? It's such a slippery slope. And we already have laws. You can see that now with the Capitol riot. Right. Everyone is, you know, they have their videos and they're arresting people one by one. And so there are laws to stop this, but it's just a very, it's vague. I just think it goes against all of our principles. And there, it was just, for me, I wanted to be part of history. So I said, well, this is my first time speaking on the floor and that's why I'm going to do this. And it really has unintended consequences that we're not going to see till uh, this starts happening. Right. And, and I want to read. Let me just share with you. There's a there's a news website, the Florida Phoenix, left leaning, okay. but it's it's within my, uh, you know, my my uh, area here. Here's what they wrote about HB1, the anti-riot bill. They say it, it's not about rioting, but anti-protest. It would get tough on protests, especially the ones with too many people of color and young people marching against, say, police brutality. It's already illegal to riot, destroy property or assault people. This bill is intended to discourage that annoying freedom of assembly thing. You may have a permit, but if you walk into the street, you're busted. If you get run over by a car, it's not the driver's fault. If you get arrested, you will do jail time. Guess who gets to decide whether a a protest is a riot the cops very subjective and every and you know what i what i thought was very poignant about i mean this bill is that you had groups that are opposed to each other on every issue they, that when there is a protest they're on both sides of the street yelling right, at each other right. but they can agree that this is a bad bill for all sides because everyone wants to have their voice and they now have instilled the fear of God in people to go out and hold a sign and say this is wrong or this is right. And so when you have groups that you know traditionally oppose each other and they're all saying there's something wrong with this bill, we should have stopped and listened. So it's 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 very scary. And so it was it was very passionate in the chamber. Uh, this is very personal and uh, it, it definitely impacts uh, communities of color. Uh, and so those those concerns were voiced. But I just want the average person who thinks, oh, it's not me. I'm not going to be. But uh-huh. the one, if you go out to say protect the Everglades, it could turn really fast and there will be an unintended consequence for you and your friends. And that's the problem with this bill. And it's this just is American. and it passed and it's been signed into law. Is this is this law now? Yes. <laughs> Unbelievable. OK, yes, so there's that. Welcome to Florida. Welcome um, to Florida. And you, by the way, you can't you're going to be you're going to think twice before you go stand, hold a sign to protect a group or to protect the Everglades. Unbelievable. Because it's this subjective bill with, you know, language and that is free to interpretation. It's it's a it's a it's an interesting uh, bill. And I feel like it, I think when as police start using it you're gonna see the the unintended consequences and hopefully we can do something to reverse it or modify uh, it please um okay so keeping in line with the the um, national republican trend florida can't be left out in the cold when it comes to voter suppression so um there is um a bill called sb90 that originates in the senate but you still have to deal with it who is dennis baxley and why does he want to keep us from voting 
I think that it's it's the I think they all get a memo quite honestly and say because all from the transgender sports bill to the voter suppression bill there's like this is what we're going to do and what's sad is we were for the first time I remember we had a great election. Yes. We did not right. make the news. There were, it wasn't like the hanging chat. Nope. There was nothing like that. There weren't hours long lines. There were, yeah, everybody you know, loved the election. Yeah. Now, and now because they have to, you know, do what they have to do. This is the way to squash the voices of people. And again, another very un-American bill. Like to not let people use drop boxes or not have family members be able to drop off. I, I was watching the testimony. I, I haven't seen the bill yet. It hasn't come through my committees. But when SOE was saying, I have a 90 year old mother, mm-hmm. she needs to be able to, you know, I, I want to be able, or her caregiver needs to be able to drop off her, her ballot. ballot. And especially since there wasn't any fraud in our state and we showed that we could do things right, this is counterintuitive. Like, what are we doing here? We should be showcasing how great we are. And then the portion of not to give water to people Which, in line. Yeah, because, oh, we, it's such a great idea in Georgia. Let's do it in Florida where it's we, even hotter. We, we vote. It's like 110 degrees. Yeah. People, pe- the one thing I can tell you is people want to have the ability to vote. They want to have their voice heard. This is the most American thing we can do. And to say you're not going to be able to give water to someone so they don't pass out in 110 degree heat. I mean, I, my election was during COVID and people still stood in really long lines mm-hmm. with their masks because they thought it was important enough to vote in that election. And we did things right. And now to turn around and say, well, we need to fix things is ridiculous. So I am definitely, I think my whole caucus will be speaking against this bill. And I don't know how you can justify not handing out water or not helping those people that are shut in and giving them access. And then just to take it a step further, to have to have you request your ballot every, every year. year. Oh, my God. Every year is like a huge problem. People are going to forget to do that. Of course. And and they, they change some their portions of the bill that does deal with signatures. And what's funny is the Republicans used to vote by mail more than the Democrats. Mm-hmm. This election, it was different. It's just very unfortunate because I think as uh, as elected officials, there are things we need to do to protect the Constitution and to protect the people and denying them access to voting or or Amendment 1, freedom of speech and assembly, is that's not what we're supposed to be doing. No, And not so no. this bill is, is it, it gets hard up here because you're I'll like, bet. why are we doing this? And then it flies through committee. And you see the votes on party lines. And, and again, the, the divide is not like it is in the U.S. Congress. This is very stilted. I mean, I'm looking at the votes on this, um, the, the COVID liability bill, that, that death sentence, as I refer to him, signed into law, um, which basically says, you know what, companies who, who have lax COVID um, mitigation standards, you can't sue them if you get sick. Basically, anybody, you, you cannot hold a, a, a company uh, liable for your catching COVID despite their lack of precautions, whatever. Um, the 83 to 31 was the vote to make it harder to sue businesses for exposing customers and workers to COVID. That's really lopsided. Well, I think what happened with that one in particular is everybody agrees this is a pandemic. We don't want to hurt our small businesses, but I can tell you why I personally voted against that bill, even though I wanted to protect everybody. They, in order, first of all, it's a constitutional right to have your day in court. Yes. So here's the here's the problem. And we tried to fix the bill. We, we offered amendments to fix the bill. So, so even if you kept the gross negligence, which makes it very difficult, which is fine. Like mm-hmm. you could, I'm not even going to argue gross negligence. I'm okay. not a lawyer, but it's a higher standard, a higher threshold to sue somebody. In order to have your day in court, the doctor has to sign an affidavit that you got COVID because Publix did not have an employee wear a mask. Oh, my God. So, so, so basically, no doctor is ever going to put his license on a line. No. So no one will ever have access to a day in court, even if it was terribly egregious. What? How can a doctor swear that you got it on this day at this establishment because of this? They're they a can. medical doctor. Right. They're not a private eye. They, right. can, they can testify that you had COVID on March 23rd, that you had a positive test result. So for me, that that raised the bar so high that 
even if you kept every other component in the bill, no one would have their day in court. Right. The other issue is um, has to do with business interruption. A lot of small businesses have been paying business interruption insurance for a very long time. And now they're in litigation with the insurance companies. They're not going to have access to file those claims. And another concern, we tried to amend this for our first responders, workman's comp claims. Mm. That's a really big deal because we're finding that COVID has, you know, the, the long haulers, the people who continue to get sick yep. and they don't get better. And, and anyone who's dealt with workman's comp, they, you know, it's a fight a lot of times. And if you have to, you go to civil litigation to, to deal with that. And so there's no avenue for that. So th- those were like, if, just if they tweaked it a little bit, if there could have been any kind of compromise, I think you would have seen it differently. But they, it just denied people access to court. Um, I know people had issues with the judge making the ruling. People had issues with gross negligence. I would, I would say keep all of that. But no one will ever be able to even prove gross negligence because they can't get through the doors of justice wow. with that sworn affidavit. Ugh. So, and, and you want to balance it because you do want to protect small businesses, sure. homeowners associations. You want to protect everybody. But this is just extreme. extreme. Very much so. And again, our governor already signed that into law. So here yes. you go. Um, I know we're running out of time. You need to get to work. So let me, I know, and I've got a list of other bills that are just like, oh, seriously? Is okay, you, can, you can do a quick bill list. Let's go. Okay, well, or, or, or you tell me. I mean, I know what, there's one on limiting the Bright Futures scholarships. Oh, there's my, gun control. You, there's, go ahead. Let me tell you about the Bright Futures because okay. I am flipping my lid okay. as a parent of a freshman in college. Okay. What are they doing? Our kids work so hard. You're going to limit their ability to take advanced placement classes, which we encourage for rigor. And now I, I just had a daughter go to four years of college and she's not even using her degree. She's doing something else. And my other daughter keeps changing her mind. Uh-huh. Are you kidding me? And I don't understand because there is an outcry statewide and they're still pushing this. The governor has said he's not going to support it. I'm like, what are you doing here? Why are you messing with something that's working so well for Floridians? And so that that bill makes me nuts because it's and and then my COVID I have a bill mm-hmm. that is they're not going to hear in the House but it's been heard in the Senate and passed so that you don't use FSA teachers FSA scores to you know punish teachers and students and right. for school grades and performance pay that's student are, aid fi- student financial aid right is FSA no no for for uh, um no it's for uh, for the elementary kids and the oh, high school okay. kids we dealing with school grades. When they take the FSA, it's used for teacher performance. Oh, okay. It's used for performance okay. pay. It's used to grade the school. It's used for retention purposes. This has not been a typical year. Families families across the state have food insecurity, housing insecurity. I'm talking to parents. Their kids have been quarantined weeks in a row. Every time there's an exposure in the school, they're dealing with loss of family members, sometimes loss of parents. Right. And they should eliminate younger. those tests this year, but yeah. they're not. And they're requiring they're, kids who are homeschooled to go into school locations right. and take these tests. And what, my, bill was, my bill was like, look, okay, if you're going to force the test, give the test, but hold the schools harmless for goodness right. sake. Hold the teachers and the kids harmless. So I was told yesterday that 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 bill wasn't get heard in committee. But the good news is the Florida PTA, the school board associations, the parents, just like the Bright Futures, they need to continue to uprise and put that pressure on. Because honestly, the governor and the commissioner of education, they can they can hold the schools harmless. So I'm going to keep speaking about this bill because I'm going to keep the pressure on because that's the right thing to do for children, teachers and communities um we had uh i had a bill two bills that have passed through their first committees one is like a common sense bill COVID has talked has shown us that there are disparities in health care well aca and the medicaid managed care plans is not required to disaggregate data which is crazy so they're not collecting data based on i'm asking them to collect data based on race primary language disability sex all the things you think they're doing, uh-huh. that's, they're, not. they're not just they're not managed with the managed health care plans. They're not doing it. So a common sense bill that doesn't cost money is to say, let's address the health care disparities by collecting data, analyzing the data and then making informed fiscal and policy decisions to meet the needs of Floridians. So that went through my first committee. I'm a prime co on Jenna's law, which closes a loophole. Uh, in the the clerk of courts so people can have access to when an injunction is filed against 
say, uh, someone who uh, sexually abused a child, mm. you can't see that information. So that passed through um, my flood bill. Um, I'm really proud of that. Um, you know, Hurricane Etta, it, Broward County was underwater. People couldn't go to the bathroom. Yep. People couldn't leave their homes. So we, our portion of the bill, which was uh, absorbed into a committee bill, has to do with the Office of Demographic and Economic Research collecting data, forecasting for sea level and inland coastal flooding rise. So that was a great bill. That was a great day for me because it was such a good bill that they said, we're going to make this bill part of a bigger bill and address the whole problem with sea level rise. So when I talk about like you're up here and you're like, is it worth it? That portion of the bill is definitely worth it because that impacts generations of Floridians. And it's the first time people are saying, wait a minute, there is there is sea level rise. There is coastal flooding. We see it in Florida with king tides. But what people don't realize it's the same thing out west where, you know, we can't drain the water fast enough. So I'm really proud of that bill. So I'm just, you know, pounding the pavements, working along, fighting against the bills that I think hurt Floridians. And so it's definitely been an experience. We have some appropriations still in play that I'm really proud of. And the Jenna's, um, Serena's Law with Representative Pearson's Maluka is a bipartisan uh, uh, bill. So I'm trying, I'm really working hard to reach across the aisle. I have some uh, bipartisan sponsorship on my appropriation bills. Uh, Representative Mooney in Key West uh, was the prime co on my inland coastal flooding. And of course, it's in a, it's in the package by the majority leader and the speaker. So I've been really, it's been, I've been able to work across the aisle because there are issues that impact every Floridian. And then there are those hot topic issues like House Bill 1, mm-hmm. like vouchers. And those things are all going to come up. And you see those bills like you spoke of that are voted on party lines. Right. But we need to really just work together because this pandemic, uh, people are still unemployed. Um, I had another bill that I'm still, hopefully we'll get across the finish line or at least next year, what I've learned is that you have to, you have long-term planning. Mm-hmm. So I have a, I carried a kid care bill, which I knew wouldn't happen this year. Florida kid budget. care, for those who don't know, it's the, the kids health insurance. It's a, it's the, the um, S chip program that we, we debated right. for so many years over the last decade or two. Which so. is amazing. It it's is amazing. amazing. Program. Oh yes. And, and you can go up to 300, you can cover people up to 300% of the poverty line. So very poor people will have free health care privilege, mm-hmm. uh, health care for their, their dependents. It's dental, it's medical, and it's mental health. Yep. And mental health is a big issue for children. Huge. But what it Definitely does is not. on a sliding scale, it allows people in need to purchase the health care for their children. Well, thank goodness we passed the, uh, the minimum wage bill. But what that does is it's going to create a funding cliff. And people will have to choose between taking the raise or losing health insurance for their families. Oh now, mind God. you, even Georgia and Alabama go up, have a higher threshold than Florida for the uh, income bracket. So what my bill does is it over five years, it increases the 200% threshold to 300%, 20% increments. So we can avoid that funding cliff and people don't have to worry about how they're going to afford health care for their children. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a tiered model where the families will pay in based on their income, but it gives them access to health care. So that bill is like, that's like, I, I'm hoping to be here for eight years. And I spoke to the speaker about it and he is a proponent of kid care. And so I know that that bill is going to be the bill I file every year and tweak until I can get that through. So I'm really proud of that bill. Cool. I also had a, um, I have a bill for confidentiality for sexual assault victims. Mm. You know, when a victim can find their voice, you know, most victims don't report crimes uh, in that nature. They're embarrassed, they're humiliated, they they don't want to report it. And so this gives them the comfort to know that their name will be confidential. And that bill really has had a huge impact on me because um, victims called me. And they say, you know, when I, when I apply for a job and you Google my name, you see my read. Oh, like, God. Like, it, it's, it's, so it's a great bill. We're, um, we're working on the language. And so I see that there's the short game and the long game. So these are some of my long games. And it's just, it's an opportunity to make a difference. And so I am proud of that. And I've, I've co-sponsored a lot of bills. Like, I came up here, you realize there are only so many good ideas. So <laughs> a lot of us had the same ideas. And if you get it in drafting yeah. first, then you get it. So a lot of bills I've, I've sponsored, uh, co-sponsored a lot of bills that I believe in. So 
I, I'm hoping that this is, uh, it'll, I think it's going to get feistier as we go through the voting bills and the uh, opt-out sex ed bill, and then we have the transgender sports bill. Uh, there are going to be some, uh, right. there are going to be and, some controversial bills coming, and, but there are a lot of bills that, that will make a difference. Like and I was one last concerned. one. Is, is there anything on gun control? I mean, I'm in Coral Springs right next door to Parkland and we've done nothing. There are bills that have been filed. Like I took Kelly Skidmore, who is an amazing uh, uh, representative and is back out. She, she has the protective order. All those bills that we file every year. I've been up here. You know this. Yep. They're just, they're not getting heard in committee. And that's what you learn when you get up here. You have to be heard in committee. So there are some good bills that are being heard. Uh, my colleague, uh, Representative Marie Woodson, has a bill which deals with seniors and homestead exemption, making the paperwork easier. But this is a this year is a really tough year because we just don't have the budget. So try, we tried like for my bills. I'm trying to I tried to create bills that didn't cost money and didn't have a negative fiscal impact. The kid care clearly will cost money, but I will tell you. It's worth so the important. It, it was so important. terrific. I mean, my kid is now 21, but she got through her all, you know, from uh, we moved back to Florida when she was starting kindergarten and she was on kid care until she turned, uh, I guess, 19 until right. her 19th you know people birthday. think there are people who are like, oh, you're just handing out free. No, no, kid you pay and what you can afford. People, uh, affordable. You, yep. First of all, another bill I have is for SHIP, which deals with affordable housing. And I'm running that for the county because there is no affordable housing in Broward County. No. The median home price is $416,000. People are strapped. You can't afford a roof over your head, your bills, and your insurance. So these programs are for the working people who, you know, when God forbid you have a, your car breaks down and it's $1,000, you have no idea where you're getting that money. Mm -hmm. It's for people who are working every day. Uh, want to continue working but need help and need that boost because they're on that fiscal cliff so that's what kid care is about that's what a lot, a lot of these programs are about the ship program uh, we're trying to amend it so counties have the discretion to use money to build rental housing because there is no multifamily like have you tried to rent an apartment in Broward County or in the South yeah, my, area? my daughter has yes and it's yeah. ridiculous my daughter's living with me because right. it's ridiculous so we we need to create avenues for people that get a roof over their head to have health care. And uh, so that's what I'm supposed to do up here in Tallahassee. So we're working on it. We'll just awesome. keep pounding away. Well, Robin Bartleman, I'm glad you're on the job. I, I wish we paid you more. And, uh, I, and I don't I, need it. But you know what? <laughs> when all is said and done, you know, I was a teacher. I know. So, so they yeah, always you're say you don't do it for the money. Never. You do it because when you're gone it's the difference you made. And Hello. I truly believe yeah. that because there's not a teacher out there who's doing it for the money because they are some of our lowest paid and most oh, overworked you know people. What? And, and so I will continue to uh, fight for everyone in South Florida and across the state and for those working families who just need that little bit of help. I, that seems to be the focus that I, that's most important to me um, because there are people, I see people like my family members who work every day will take uh, double shifts, overtime, mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. it takes. And they just need that little bit of help to yep. the kid care to have access to their kid can go to the dentist when they have a cavity and they yep. can afford it. You know, and we need to do something about the affordable housing in Broward County because without a without a, you know, a roof over your head and you're going to lose the workforce. It's going to impact our quality of life if people can't afford to live here. Oh, I agree. And South Florida used to be very affordable. I, you know, I moved yeah. back here from Los Angeles where it was, I couldn't believe how easy, you know, the house prices were. Well, that's all changed. Everything. Oh, I changed. couldn't afford my house now. Thank God oh, I, I bought it 26 right. years ago. I hear And you can't afford to move. No. So no. everybody's kind of stuck. But for like you and I with children coming out of college, and for people who are trying to relocate, uh, you know, a rookie police officer, a teacher, they cannot afford at four hundred and sixteen thousand dollars is the median price. Wow. You can't afford that. No, no one can afford that. No, no. So. Someone's got to give. Um, yeah. All right. Well, Robin, I'm going to let you go. I know you got a lot of work to do. Thank you so much for spending time with us today and, oh, and letting us know. You. And maybe we can check in uh, towards the end of the session and see, you know, what happened. Oh, yeah. Or in the middle. Or in the middle. When that voting bill comes up, that's going to be a oh, huge Oh, yes. Okay. Well, we'll stay in touch. Thank All you right. so much. It was great to see you, you again. Good to reconnect. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a wonderful night. 
and we will reconvene again tomorrow. Uh, Howie Klein will be here. I guess I can put the, 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 the picture, picture back, back up. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm off kilter today. No, that's not the name of the show. I, watching a man have the life squeezed out of him over and over again will do that to a person. I'm not liking this country. I'm not liking the people in it. I'm not liking anything about it right now. It sucks. It all fucking sucks. We need to do better. All right. I'll see you tomorrow. Sandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. This time, it really is Infrastructure Week. The White House on Wednesday officially unveils its $2.25 trillion Build Back Better. It's coming through the wrong thing. Hold on one second. I'm going to play this for you. Oh, there we go. Okay, I can mute that and play it here. Including highways, water systems, and transit agencies. With another $400 billion allocated to care for the elderly and people with disabilities, $300 billion apiece will head to affordable housing and reviving U.S. manufacturing. President Biden is expected to propose a plan to pay for the infrastructure push that includes increasing the corporate tax rate to 28% from 21 and raising the top individual income tax rate to 39.6% from 37%. And it would end tax breaks and subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. It's about time. More details to come, but keep in mind this is just the White House proposal. Many changes will be made before anything is finalized in a bill. Day two of the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd featured a lot of evidence and testimony from six witnesses. Darnella Frazier was just 17 when she shot the video of Floyd's final moments. She took the stand and provided some of the most powerful testimony of the day. Would you tell the ladies and gentlemen how you're viewing, experiencing what happened to George Floyd has affected your life? When I look at George Floyd, I look at, I look at my dad, I look at my brothers, I look at my cousins, my uncles, because they are all black. I have black, I have a black father, I have a black brother, I have black friends. And I, I look at that and I look at how that could have been one of them. It's been nights. I stayed up apologizing and, and apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more and not physically interacting and not saving his life, but it's like, it's not what I should have done. It's what he should have done. Frazier said Floyd was clearly suffering as he begged for his life while officers pinned him in the street during an arrest attempt while Chauvin kept his knee on Floyd's neck for nine minutes. We also heard from Darnella's nine-year-old cousin who was with her that day. And an off-duty Minneapolis firefighter who you can clearly hear on the video repeatedly telling officers to check Floyd's pulse. When testimony resumes on Wednesday, Genevieve Hansen will return to the stand. Again, Chauvin is facing charges of unintentional second-degree murder, third-degree murder, and manslaughter. The New York Times on Tuesday afternoon reported that the Justice Department is investigating whether Congressman Matt Gates of Florida had a sexual relationship with a 17-year-old girl and paid for her to travel with him 
in a possible violation of federal sex trafficking laws. The matter reportedly grew out of another, a bigger investigation into a guy named Joel Greenberg. He's the former Seminole County, Florida tax collector and a Gates political ally who was indicted last summer on child sex trafficking charges. Gates told the Times that his lawyer said he was the subject, not a target of the investigation, which he alleged was part of an extortion scheme involving, quote, false sex allegations. Uh Uh-huh. This story is just beginning. Stay tuned. Well, President Biden on Tuesday unveiled his first slate of judicial nominees, hailing the diverse group as trailblazing. Nine of the 11 are women. Three of the nominees are black women being nominated for the U.S. Court of Appeals, which often serves as a pathway for nominees to the Supreme Court. Also on Tuesday, the Biden administration let journalists into its main border detention facility for migrant children for the first time. Though it was designed for a capacity of 250 people, it's currently crammed with more than 4,100, including children and families. President Biden is under pressure to increase transparency at these migrant processing centers as a wave of new people try to get across the southern border into the country, many of them South American migrants seeking asylum. And the White House on Tuesday also announced several executive actions in response to this surge we're experiencing in anti-Asian hate crimes. The moves came after two Asian-American senators complained that there weren't enough Asian-Americans in high-ranking positions in the Biden administration. And as activists demand more attention to the violence that's escalating against Asian-Americans in the wake of last week's shooting in Atlanta and the former guys blaming China for the COVID pandemic. President Biden also announced the reinstatement of the White House initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and announced a forty nine and a half million dollar grant program for Asian American and Pacific Islander survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence plus a COVID-19 equity task force to address xenophobia and a Justice Department initiative to curb rising hate crimes targeting Asian Americans. So recall on Friday, the former guy went on Fox Not News and said that his supporters were, quote, hugging and kissing the law enforcement officers at the Capitol on January 6th. Well, now two of those U.S. Capitol Police officers are suing the former president for inciting the insurrectionists on January 6th, nearly leading to their deaths. The veteran cops James Blassingame and Sidney Hemby said that members of the mob used pepper spray and tear gas to assault them during the deadly riot, and they blamed Donald Trump for the injuries they suffered defending the Capitol. In their complaint, they note Trump's December 19th, 2020 tweet in which he told supporters, quote, big protest in D.C. on January 6th. Be there. We'll be wild. Hey, breaking news on Wednesday morning. As Pfizer says that its COVID-19 vaccine is safe and 100 percent effective in preventing the illness in teenagers aged 12 to 15. Pfizer is expected to ask for emergency authorization to begin vaccinating the tweens before they head back to school in the fall. Smoke them if you got them. In Virginia, Democratic Governor Ralph Northam announced amendments to legislation establishing a timeline for the legalization of marijuana possession, use, cultivation, and retail sales. He recommended that the provisions that legalize personal possession and personal cultivation by adults take effect on July 1st. 2021 rather than on january 1st 2024 the enactment date initially approved by lawmakers if the legislature approves the amendment those age 21 and older would be permitted to possess up to one ounce of marijuana and to cultivate up to four cannabis plants per household without penalty as soon as later this year the virginia legislature will reconvene on april 7th to accept or reject the proposed amendments And in New York, all that's left is Andrew Cuomo's signature. New York's legislature voted to legalize possession of small amounts of marijuana, launch programs to help communities that bore the brunt of the national and state drug war, and eventually allow marijuana sales to people over the age of 21 under a big new bill. Once Cuomo gets the legislation, 
He has 10 days to approve or veto it. He has said he's looking forward to signing the bill. And things aren't looking too good for the former guy. A federal judge on Tuesday ruled that the non-disclosure agreement he required employees to sign is so broad and vague that it is unenforceable. There's always been a question of whether public employees can be forced to swear a vow of secrecy, but Trump's Department of Justice was willing to try to enforce his NDAs. Trump's lawyers say they are considering an appeal. Now, in other Trump-related legal trouble news, the New York State Court of Appeals ruled that a defamation lawsuit against the former guy by former Apprentice contestant Summer Zervos could continue. The suit had been on hold because Trump's lawyers argued that a sitting president couldn't face legal action. While two previous courts ruled against him, this decision is from the highest court in New York, and it opens up the possibility that Trump will face a deposition in which he could be asked under oath about sexual assault accusations. And that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and the Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener supported, and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com, and please click on that donate button.